I would turn to 575, 575. Next Sunday, we have a missionary with us, Chico Pinto, I believe is how it's pronounced, a missionary to Brazil. Then on the 23rd is work day, 24th is family day slash harvest party. We will be having the harvest party immediately after the morning service, and I think Mary's going to bring around a sign-up sheet so we don't have uh, 600 hot dogs and nothing else, so, so she's going to kind of help organize that. All right, November 7th, DVD Sunday, and also communion on the 28th is Family Day. Just a couple of reminders about uh, some of the other schedule. We don't put this in the bulletin, but I want you to be aware of it. On Sunday nights, we have a Bible study at 5 o'clock, and we are starting a new series now on, uh, I'm calling it Socially Acceptable Christian Sins, um, because we tend to focus on the sins of those wicked people out there, the fact is that that's not going to bring revival. That's not really going to do anything. So when we focus on our own lives and our own sins, and um, my the byline for this series is change yourself, change the world. So we're going to look at uh, Christian sins, things that we normally or we accept, we shouldn't normally accept, but we accept in our lives. And the first one's ungodliness. And I know as soon as I say that, you say, well, ungodliness, that's those people out there. Well, come tonight, you might learn different, all right? Also, hand, hand, chime, choir, hand chime choir practice. Is that the way we say that? Four, 
4.15 tonight. And then on um, Wednesday nights, we're studying the book of Ephesians, thoroughly enjoying that. Uh, 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 all God's word's good, but some of it's gooder, <laughs> at least to me. So any, that's bad grammar, good theology, right? I um, encourage you to come to that on Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock. We have a men's Bible study. Again, just really enjoying that study, that time we spend together. Um, I know there's a danger that we just sit around all time study the Bible and we don't do anything with it. But we need to do both. We need to get much of the Word of God and then we need to apply it, take it out and use it, utilize it. So just encourage you to be a part of all these things. All right, it is time for the penny marks, 144, 144. Folks, we're glad to have you in the services today. And uh, I seen a first pastor. I seen they bring a, the, one of the kids brought their offering uh, in a can lid. I don't think I've ever seen. A, <laughs> I've seen Ziploc bags and um, little socks or something, you know. But I've never seen a can lid. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I like that. Uh, but by the way, pastor, I don't think 600 hot dogs is all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> no bugs. No yeah, yeah. Well, if you're on one of those keto diets, you know that's probably okay. <laughs> We're glad that you're here this morning. May the Lord bless you for having come out and met with us. Had a good offering last week. Always make sure you check that, kind of have an idea what uh, we are doing and how we are doing. And uh, we want to encourage folks to be good stewards of all that God gives us. And a lot of things coming down the lines as pastors have uh, shared with you all the announcements and so forth. So I trust that you will uh, do your best to avail yourself to those things. Our missionary for this week is Arnie and Rose Chuan, and they're serving the Lord in the Philippines. One of the best, I don't want to say one of the best, but one of the most open fields for us. And you need to pray for the people in the Philippines because they are really under a tight lockdown. Duarte is not a friend of Christians. I don't know if you realize that or not, uh, but uh, he's a... Uh, He's a pretty fierce type of leader over there in the Philippines, out there in the Philippines. I don't know where it's at, but anyway, pray for those folks because that has been a great harvest field for God's workers there. Our stewardship moment comes from the letter of Apostle Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses number 18 and 19. And the gist of this passage of Scripture is this, is that you be filled with the Spirit, that you sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God and the Father. Our thoughts this morning I want to center on, on are we stewards of all that we hear at church? Are we stewards of the messages that we hear at church? The great opera singer Enrico Caruso, unrelated to Robinson Caruso, I think, I don't know, uh, said a, a, an opera singer needs, a big, needs big lungs, a big mouth, 90% memory, 10% intelligence, lots of hard work, and something in their heart thought about that, you know, uh, to be a biblical believer, 
One thing you do need to have is someone in your heart, not just something. You need someone in your heart. And, of course, we know that to be Jesus Christ. It should be our constant prayer, I believe, here at Victory Baptist, that the hearts of folks who hear the sermons that Brother Landon and the Pastor Mike share with us, that those messages will draw people to Christ, that we'll all be drawn to Christ to, and to be filled with his spirit in our lives. So they call us, our pastors call us to consider how we serve the Lord, to confess the things that are not pleasing to God. They call us to be encouraged uh, and, and all the good qualities that we should be seen in the life of a Christian. Uh, I appreciate what the uh, New Testament scholar Leon Morris said. He says, there's no point in accepting and hearing Christian teaching if we refuse to let it shape our lives. That's really true. You know, there's no real value if you say, yeah, well, I know we believe that and I believe that and all this, but does it really shape our lives? Does it really change our life if there is a need for us to be changed? Uh, we are called to live as children of the light, and this includes understanding what God's will is for our lives and being filled with his Spirit being more like Christ, to speak the truth, to sing praises to God and to thank God and to submit to God and also to the sense that we submit to one another as Christian brothers and sisters. And doing these things, of course, we know is not just limited to when we come together as a, as a group of people in a community and worship together. We speak the truth always, sing praises from our heart at any time, thank God for all the things at all times that he blesses us with. We are to submit, submit to one another uh, out of reverence for Christ. So our challenge this morning, as we look at this in the way of stewardship, our challenge this morning is, in what ways am I shining the light of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ in this world today? Because we hear the messages from our pastors we hear the messages that they share with us. And do we, do we, are we stewards of what we hear? Do we go out then, allow those messages to change our life, to change our heart, and we go out and we try to make a difference in the hearts and lives of people who are out there who may not know Christ, who may be in darkness? Are we shining the light of Christ? <laughs> Morning to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Uh, we're going to finish a message I started a couple of weeks ago uh, where we kind of have changed our emphasis from the how-to of worship to the who of worship. And we'll say more about that in just a minute. But Jeremiah, chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, 
that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, again, we come to you this morning as a needy people. And Lord, I, I'm convinced that most of the time we're not even aware of our greatest needs. Certainly when it comes to that unseen battle that we're in, Lord, we're, we're but children. And so we need your grace this morning. Lord, the, the souls of men and women are at stake. And Lord, the last thing that we want, want as Landon preached earlier, is to get in the way this morning. So we pray not, only, not for your help so much as for you just to take over everything today. Lord, my lips, your lips, my mind, your mind, my hands, your hands, my feet, your feet. And Lord, may we all have that attitude for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Lord, we pray as always that for someone here this morning that does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, Lord, for them that... That is the issue, Lord, the issue that has eternal consequences. And I pray that you would remove the satanic blinders, allow the glorious light of the gospel to shine in that today they might be saved. And then, Lord, for those of us that know you, may we again be lost in the wonder of who you are. And, Lord, may you become uh, not a sideline or, or an addition to a busy life, but Lord, may you be consuming in our lives. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, remind you, J.I. Packer said in his excellent book, Knowing God, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? Again, to know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. What is the best thing in life? Bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else. It is the knowledge of God. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understand and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exer exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight saith the Lord. You know, there's a lot of things in life that we can pursue. In fact, I, I don't know about you, but I, I in the, especially this last week, have just felt overwhelmed by busyness, by what, I, what I'm learning more and more is distractions, things that are taking my attention off what is the most important and the most important thing in life is the pursuit of God himself, the worship of God Almighty. So we have changed our focus, not that we have abandoned the subject of worship, but we've changed our focus from what worship is to the one whom we are to worship. And the idea is that if we're going to worship God correctly, we must know him and know what he's like. And the reason for that is if we don't, we're going to have a tendency to invent a God that we like, a palatable God, a God that doesn't interfere, a God that lets me do my own thing, but he's there. I think this, was, it, was this in our Bible study that, uh, that a lot of people treat God like my my wife, was that in our Bible study? <laughs> uh, she doesn't talk to me at all unless she needs something. I think sometimes we treat God that way. We don't talk to him at all unless we need something. So we're starting to learn about 
God. I, hopefully we're not starting to learn, but being reminded of a few things. And we begin in the last message looking at the essence of God. The essence of God is not an idea or a personification of an idea, but it's the very substance of God. It's what makes God God, if you please. And the first element of God's essence is his spirituality. God possesses substance, but not in the way we normally think of substance. He does not possess material substance. And that is what we normally think of when we think of substance. But we're clearly told by the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is spirit. In the King James Version, it says a spirit, but there's no article in the Greek language. It's not that God is a spirit, but God is spirit. That is, the very essence of God is spirit. Now, what does that mean? All right, first of all, it means that he's immaterial and incorporeal. That is, he does not possess, like we do, flesh and blood. When he was trying to convince his disciples that his resurrection body was not a spirit, Jesus said in Luke 24, 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So God is spirit means that he is not flesh and bones. The very nature of spirit is non-corporal. Since God is spirit and the nature of spirit is non-corporal, then God must be non-corporal. The references to him as having hands and eyes and feet and ears are symbolic and not literal. They are attempts to relate an infinite being to finite beings. They serve to make God real and to express his various interests, powers, and activities. All right, secondly, God is spirit means that he is invisible. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image in the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. And by the way, as Christians, we don't need aids to worship. We don't need visible expressions of an invisible God. In fact, we don't even need expressions of a long-haired Jesus. For one thing, nobody knows what he looks like. And then even if we, if we did have a picture of Jesus, what would be the tendency? The tendency would be for us to worship that visible image. But the reality is God is invisible. In fact, John 1.19 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 1 Timothy 6.16, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Say, what about the references in Scripture to seeing God? Ari Tori notes that a man may see the reflection of his face in a glass. It would be true for the man to say, I saw my face, and also I never saw my face. Likewise, men saw the reflection of his glory, but they did not see his essence. Thirdly, God is spirit means that he is alive. The idea of spirit not only excludes the idea of a material substance, 
but it excludes the idea of inanimate substance. Spirit implies life. God is called the living God. Joshua 3.10, Hereby ye shall know the living God is among you. Psalm 84 verse 2, My soul longeth, yet even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh crieth out for the living God. 1 Thessalonians 1.9, for they themselves show of what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Life implies feeling and power and activity. God has these. Not only has he these, but he is the source of these. The source of all life, plant, animal, human, spiritual, and eternal life. For as the Father hath life in himself, Jesus said, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. God is alive, whereas the idols of the heathen are lifeless. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 115, 3 through 9, but our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet they have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. Ouch. So is everyone that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. God is alive. And that's why we can have to do with him. Number four, he is a person. God is not an impersonal spirit. The very idea of spirit implies personality coming from life. A belief in an impersonal God strikes a fatal blow in the truth that we're trying to establish, that I'm working up a sweat trying to establish. That is that God can be known, and God must be known. If God does not possess personality, but is simply the Star Wars force or the Indian's great spirit that is in the wind and the trees and the rocks, he cannot be known. You cannot know an impersonal force. And that's one of the many of the fatal flaws of the New Age movement. They regulate God to some sort of mystical power to be tapped into for your own personal ends. According to Lehman Strauss, God is a personal being. This is the Christian view of God in contrast to the area of pantheism. Many religious people are pantheists. Pantheism is the belief that all things aggregate constitute God and that God is everything and everything is God. To the pantheist, God is identified with nature, not independent and separate from it. Thus a mere unconscious force working in the world. Pantheism differs from atheism with its positive denial of God. And from agnosticism with this dogmatic doubt, I love that, about the existence of God, but, neither, but it is neither Christian nor truly religious. Religion's been defined as a belief in an invisible superhuman power on whom man regards himself as dependent and to whom he thinks himself to some degree responsible. Religion in that sense and includes the idea of communion between God and man. Therefore, if God were not a personal being, there could be no communion. There can be no real communion between a man and a mere influence. It's absolutely essential then to the true definition of religion that both God and man be personal beings. The likeness of man and God as possessing personhood is implied in the creation record. God, Genesis 1.27, created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, 
male and female created he them. The faculties and elements belonging to personality, namely intelligence and emotion and will, belong to both God and man. There is, of course, a difference between divine personality and human personality. And knowing that difference is part of knowing God. Now, what does all of that mean? It is fundamental to our faith and relationship to God. Remember, Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that true worship of God must come through his Son, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The beginning knowledge that every person needs of God is the knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. Again, John 17, 3, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The beginning of the quest of knowing God is knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. In order to do that, you must first of all repent of your sin. Repentance is a lost doctrine in, in Christian in America today, but it's not lost as far as the Bible's concerned. Repentance, in the simplest way, you can think of, Landon did a good job of talking about this this morning. God created us, and what did we do? Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. God made us, he owns us, but we rebelled against him. We went our own way, doing our own thing. That's what sin is. Sin is self-autonomy. Self-lordship, it's ignoring God. And by the way, that's what ungodliness is. It's ignoring God. Going our own way and doing our own thing. We're pursuing sin. Repentance is turning your back on that and turning back to the Creator. Sin is rebellion against the Creator. Repentance is turning from that back to Him. So first of all, you have to repent of your sin. Secondly, you must believe the record of the gospel in God's word. Uh, you know what? There, there, the little cute bumper stickers out there said, God said it, uh, I believe it, that settles it. That, that's not quite factual. God said it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. But the, whether you believe it or not determines the eternal destiny of your soul. God has taken great lengths to give us his word. And in his word is the gospel message. The gospel message is that Jesus Christ came. He, lived a, he was God incarnate, God come in the flesh. He lived a perfect life and then died for sin. But not his sin because he lived a perfect life. He died for our sin. That and they buried him, they literally buried him because he was dead, but on the third day he rose from the grave. That's the gospel message for your justification, the Bible says. So you have to believe the gospel record. Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died for our sin, was buried, rose the third day, ascended back to the Father, and is coming again one day to take us to be with him. You have to believe the gospel record. And then thirdly, you have to receive Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Our men's Bible study this came out yesterday. Uh, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. You have to, you have to call and ask him. I, you know, this is the same thing about the gospel message. It is, it is exclusive in that the only way you can be saved is Jesus it is inclusive in that anybody can come. If you will do what I just said this morning, anybody can be saved. Christ's atonement was sufficient to pay for all the sins of all mankind, but it's not applied 
until you come and you call on the name of the Lord. That's how you establish that relationship. You're reconciled to God, then you become... In fact, salvation can be thought of as, as God making worshipers out of rebels. God making worshipers out of rebels. That begins with G Jesus Christ. J.I. Packer suggests there are four things we must do then in order to get to know God intimately. Number one, you need to listen to God's word and receive it as the Holy Spirit interprets it in application to yourself. I cannot overemphasize the necessity of being a student of God's word. In fact, this is how God speaks to you. So if you leave it on the shelf, he's not talking to you. You have to get into the word of God. You have to study the word of God. If you're going to worship the God of the Bible, you have to know the Bible. It's pretty simple. All right, so first of all, listen to God's word, receive it as the Holy Spirit interprets it and applies it to yourself. Number two, note God's nature and character as his word and works reveals. It's what's wrong with Christianity today. People are ignorant of the word. And because they're ignorant of the word, they're ignorant of the God of the word. They may be worshiping a God, but they're not worshiping the God. Because there's only one way you can find out about him, and that's his word. So, know God's nature and character, and that's what we're doing in this study, and, and as his word and works reveal. And number three, accept his invitations, do what he commands. Boy, what a novel thought. I mean, that we would do what our maker tells us to do. But that, if you want to know him, that's the, that's the path. Uh, accept his invitation, do what he commands. And then lastly, recognize and rejoice in the love that he has shown in taking the initiative to draw us to fellowship with him. God loves you. And, and you say, well, I don't feel very loved. It's not a matter of feelings. In fact, there's a sense when, when we talk about the, the love of God, it's past tense because that's where the, the supreme demonstration was. For God so loved, past tense, the world that he want, gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know how you, lo you know that God loves you? But God commendeth or demonstrates his love towards you. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you for time and eternity. And again, you, you need to begin that relationship through Jesus Christ. You cannot, though, know God apart from knowing his word. A casual 10-minute-a-day reading is not what it takes to know his word. Most people average 30 minutes a day reading the newspaper. Well, not so much anymore. Uh, I, I would say Facebook now, and who knows how much time we waste there. Hmm, got real quiet in here, didn't it? How much time, though, in contrast, do we spend studying, reading, meditating upon it, and memorizing the Bible? That's what it really takes to know God. Do you know him? I challenge you. And God's been convicting me about this. Two things. Number one, wasting too much time, way too much time on things that don't matter. And secondly, you know, over the years we've constantly, God help me, God help me, God help me. He doesn't want to help us. He wants to possess us. He don't want to help us. He wants to take over. And so, Get in his word and allow him to speak to your hearts and then yield to him. There's nothing, nothing, nothing more important. You know, a lot of, in America, here's the great American dream. I'm going to get a good education so I can get a good job, so I can make a lot of money, so I can bottle, buy a lot of things and have a lot of fun. You know what? What a shallow way to live. Because the truth of the matter is, there's not one thing you're going to take past the grave. Not one thing. The thing that matters is God 
himself. I, and I challenge you, make time. Make time. Make time to pursue him. For, just for the sake of him. Not for what he gives you, but just for the sake of him. That's what will make you a, a worshiper when we begin to know the God that, that loves us and, and made a way for us to have a relationship with him. All right, let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you so much that you have revealed yourselves to us. And Lord, that we can have a relationship. What a wonder of wonders that, that we as a little insignificant speck in your universe can have a relationship with you. One who is so immense that we can't even fathom. And yet, and yet, Lord, you not only have time for it, but you want a relationship with us. What an amazing thing. And you want to great lengths that we can have that relationship. And Lord, I pray if there's someone in here this morning that does not have that relationship, Lord, that they would establish it now before it's everlasting too late. And for those of us that know you, help us to have a hunger and thirst for you and not so much for Lord, this world, you tell us, love not the world, neither the things of the world. And so, Lord, help us to have a hunger and thirst for you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing a couple of verses of invitation. Hymn number 355. 355. If you need to be saved... And you Somebody that knows the Bible and loves you, they'll sit down quietly. They'll show you in God's Word how you can know that you're saved. If you are saved, you know, I, I read a sermon one time. It's one of those life changing sermons. It's by Van Tavern's training, uh, his training <laughs> marvels for diamonds. And that's what we do. We, we, we live our lives for stuff that doesn't matter. Instead of living for who really matters, God Himself. So maybe this morning you can come, rededicate your life to the living for Him and pursuing Him and hungering for Him and being content with Him. As we sing, 355.